right, everybody, we're going to move on to basically part two of our talks on vasculitis. And we're going to talk here about the large ves vessel vasculitides. Um, so these are quite different, and there are fewer, and they are distinct from one another. So <laughs> unlike the small and medium vasculitides, which share so much in common, um, these are quite different. So it's going to be a lot easier for you to remember these ones. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put up a new video, which I try to do frequently. All right, so um, this is just our overview of vasculitides. Um, these symptoms are primarily going to be associated with uh, small and medium um, vasculitis. So for the large vasculitides, you're not going to see these too much. You'll probably run into constitutional symptoms um, and possibly some of these lab disturbances and maybe arthralgia, uh, but these are quite distinct. Uh, biopsy is always going to be the most accurate test because it tells you the vasculitis, right? You're looking at the arteries um, or the, the vessels that are inflamed. Um, so if you can directly look at it, you can make the diagnosis. Now, that doesn't mean we always do it, um, but it's worth knowing that it is the most accurate test. Um, the therapy usually involves a corticosteroid and sometimes, in many instances, an adjunctive cytotoxic like uh, methotrexate, for instance. So we're going to talk about giant cell arteritis, um, and then we'll talk about Takayasu's arteritis, and then we'll talk about Bissette's, um, which doesn't really fit into any of these. All right, so if you watched my video on polymyalgia rheumatica, you probably have an idea of what giant cell arteritis is. So it is a, an inflammatory disease of the vessels, primarily affecting medium and large arteries, um, and, but it primarily affects the head and the scalp. Um, so you're going to have things like headache and scalp tenderness and stuff like that. Um, so this almost only occurs in older people. So over 55, but more commonly 60s, 70s, and 80s. And often these patients will have a pre-existing diagnosis or they will fit the criteria for polymyalgia rheumatica. There's a lot of overlap here. The symptoms are going to be pain in the scalp, pain in the temples, pain on chewing, um, and then possibly visual disturbances, which is a huge problem and, and really makes this an emergency. So in physical examination, expect to see scalp tenderness if you palpate, and then you may see an enlarged superficial temporal artery, and I'll show you some pictures of that. Keep a very high index of suspicion for giant cell arteritis because the consequences can be disastrous. Um, so what you want to do if you have a patient coming in like this, especially if they have a history of PMR, is to just get the biopsy and, and treat them immediately. So if, if for whatever reason you can't get a biopsy and you suspect they have giant cell arteritis, you're going to treat them for it immediately. Do not delay the treatment if you can't get the labs and the biopsy. It's good to get it, but treatment comes first because you're going to be giving them prednisone. And there's, there are side effects to prednisone, but they're not going to be on it for very long. Best initial diagnostic step is to get a SED rate. Um, that will rule out uh, giant cell arteritis, um, but it is nonspecific. And remember that the biopsy is the most accurate test. And it's a pain to get it, um, no pun intended, because you have to get a lot of the artery, like a centimeter, because you kind of have like these skip lesions where the, uh, the artery is affected in only small areas and kind of a random distribution. So you want to get at least one centimeter of artery. So this is that uh, engorged temporal artery, superficial temporal artery um, that you may notice. So sometimes it can be fairly obvious. 
Treatment is prednisone. The disease is self-limited, so the prednisone is used to treat the symptoms while it exists and make sure you send these patients off to ophthalmology because it can result in long-term visual complications. Takayasu arteritis is uh, inflammation and stenosis of medium and large size arteries, but primarily we're looking at large size arteries, um, the aortic arch and its branches. It usually affects young women and it is more prevalent in Asians. Um, it got the name Takayasu arteritis because it was discovered um, in Japan, so that makes sense. The symptoms here include limb claudication. Consider that if we're affect if we're um, if it's affecting the, those initial branches of the aortic arch, so brachiocephalic, common carotid, um, you can get limb claudication very easily because that's where all your blood is coming from to go to both your brain and head and also to your upper limbs. So if you get any um, stenosis there. Um, it can certainly lead to uh, symptoms that are consistent with that. Um, so you can uh, get, uh, you can also get constitutional features, but those are going to be a little bit less salient. So dizziness with upper limb exertion. Why would that happen? Well, if you have a blockage um, in the subclavian, uh, or I'm sorry, in the common carotid, for instance, um, what's going to happen is that when you start exerting those limbs, you're going to have more flow that way. You know, there's less resistance. And so it's going to steal the blood that's supposed to be going to the brain. Um, and so what happens is you exert your upper extremities, less blood to the brain, and so you get dizziness with upper limb exertion. That's subclavian steel syndrome. Physical exam is important for establishing the suspicion, so look for a brewery, uh, either in the carotid or subclavian artery, because that's where blockage tends to go. Aortic regurgitation, just because this can affect the aorta, you can get regurgitation um, that's going to cause a diastolic murmur. A weak upper extremity pulse, depending on where the blockage is, and then you can get a blood pressure difference between the arms. Um, so, for instance, if you have um, some sort of blockage, uh, in the brachiocephalic artery, but no blockage elsewhere, um, it's going to um, cause a differential in pressure because of the increased resistance on one side versus the other. These are the ACR criteria. Um, generally, Takayasu arteritis is pretty evident clinically because it presents in a very unique way. Um, so um, just keep in mind these symptoms that are very common. Um, so first of all, age 40, remember the patient population, that extremity claudication, decreased pulses, uh, that difference in blood pressure between arms, you can get uh, a brewery. And um, then if you were to get an arteriogram, which is going to be super important, um, that is another criteria. Um, by using these criteria, it's very sensitive and specific for Takayasu. The most accurate test is going to be arteriography uh, or MRA. So this is normal here, and I'm going to switch my pen to red if I can. There we go. So notice here we have the arch of the aorta, and then we have uh, the brachiocephalic on the right. And then we have here the common carotid on the left, and here we have subclavian on the left. Now, what you can see here, if I can zoom in a little bit, is you can see that the brachiocephalic is fine, but we have a problem here with the common carotid, and we don't even see the subclavian, um, which this arrow is trying to point to. Um, so this is our, our I call it stenosis, but this is not atherosclerosis, but you, you essentially have a stenosis here um, of this common carotid vessel and subclavian, okay? So again, you can see here, um, the this is sort of the opposite here, brachiocephalic is stenosed, and then common carotid is stenosed, and then you have a little bit of stenosis here um, of the subclavian. All right, so you can also get narrowing of vessels of the, coming off the abdominal aorta. So here we see the renal vessels are stenosed, 
And we also see right before the uh, bifurcation, there's some stenosis right here. Um, so this will lead to one of the potential complications of Takayasu. And then you can see another view here. Okay, um, so this is the criteria for Takayasu. Um, the treatment for, uh, for Takayasu is prednisone and methotrexate. And uh, that is fairly new. Um, we used to just give prednisone, but now the recommendations are to give both. Uh, remember that when you're giving methotrexate, you want to give supplemental folate or leucovorin. Um, the second line, if this does not work, would be infliximab. And then there's always surgical options if none of this resolves the disease. Complications. Hypertension. Why hypertension? Because if you're blocking off flow to the kidneys, you're going to activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and that's going to raise the blood pressure. If the kidneys aren't getting blood, they're going to think you're hypotensive, right? Peripheral vascular ischemia, obviously, because we have blockage. TIA stroke, same reason. Congestive heart failure due to the aortic regurgitation. You're putting more load onto the heart and then complications from treatment, namely prednisone. All right, one more, and this doesn't really belong with the others, and that's Bisset syndrome. Bisset syndrome is a systemic vasculitis that is characterized by this unique picture of recurrent oral and genital ulcers, as well as cutaneous lesions and ophthalmic problems like iritis. The symptoms do not appear all at once, so you'll wanna get a good history. There is a higher prevalence in the Middle East, Mediterranean, and East Asia. And like I said, it primarily affects the eyes, mucous membranes, like uh, the mouth, and the genitals. So look for recurrent aphthous ulcers. Those are probably the most common manifestation. Genital ulcers, which can be painful. Uh, eye pain with redness, which is uveitis. Um, iritis, and then these skin manifestations like erythema nodosum, very nonspecific, um, and an acneiform rash, so it looks like acne. They can also get abdominal pain and tenderness because this can affect abdominal vessels as well. So these are aphthous ulcers, they're canker sores, but you know, we all get them, but you shouldn't get this many all at once, right? Here's uveitis. And then you can get retinal vasculitis. I'm gonna switch here to green. Um, so what are we looking for? Well, this here is normal. And what you will see with retinal vasculitis, which we can see in uh, Bissette's, is this sort of cuffing, they call it frosting, around the vessels. And that's inflammatory um, infiltrates, infiltrates of inflammatory cells. So you can see it even more prominently here. Okay, and this is retinal vasculitis, and so this is a, a feature that we see in Bissette's. Here's erythema nodosum. These are painful nodules. Um, they don't look very prominent, but they are extremely painful, and we see this in a variety of diseases, including Crohn's. Um, but uh, again, it just it fits the picture, so you want to know that it's part of this. This is the acneiform nodules. It looks like a teenager with acne, but instead you're gonna get it in a 30 year old who you know, is well past that point in their life. And uh, this is again, consistent with Bissette's. These are the ISG criteria for Bissette's. Notice uh, that they have to have oral aphthous ulcers. Um, if you don't have that, you can't have besets, and then they need to have two of the following, genital ulceration, the eye lesions, the skin lesions, um, or this uh, positive pathogy test, um, which you can uh, read into uh, if you want. So the treatment, if, uh, it's, if you have ocular, GI, or CNS features, um, then we go with prednisone and a cytotoxic like azathioprine, and you may add infliximab. However, if you just have muca uh, mucocutaneous ulcers, like those canker sores, and that's it, you can use topical corticosteroids, and you can add on colchicine or this new drug called apremilast. 
And this is my dog, Axel. I included this picture on my original video. I believe that was in 2013, so he was only a year and a half old. Unfortunately, Axel passed away um, last November. Um, he was 11, so he lived a long life, but this is my baby. So, um, yeah, so hopefully you enjoyed this video, and I will see you next time.